Are, we have brought um, almost all, just over 100 black women to the Capitol to advocate for black women's issues today. Um, this is something that's been in the making for quite some time. Um, women with a Vision has been uh, doing uh, meetings, small meetings, um, with black women across the state. We had a f our final meeting, uh, was a larger meeting in New Orleans in December, and what came out of it was there were policy issues that black women were dealing with um, that are intersectional. And so we're like, let's bring all these black women to Baton Rouge and center these ideas and these issues and push the policy pieces that are important to us, push against the ones that are uh, injurious to us, and just make sure our voice is heard and that we're, that, you know, our policymakers know that we're here. What are those? What are the main issues and policies that your um, organization is concerned with? Well, we, uh, Women with a Vision, we utilize an intersectional framework. So we advocate with and for marginalized black women communities across the city, state, and the south. And so we work with women who are sex workers. We work with women who are addicted to intravenous drugs, women who are living with HIV and AIDS, um, women who are currently and formerly incarcerated. So it's all the issues that pertain to them. So one of the things that we're pushing today is health care, that everybody is... Um, um, has, a, has a right to quality, to access to quality health care. Um, the criminal justice reform package um, is a huge one for us. Um, we're hugely supportive of the 10 bills that the governor has presented um, through the Justice Reinvestment Task Force. Um, a couple of those bills were supposed to be up today, um, and so we're here to support those bills as well. Um, and economic equity, Helena Moreno and her IGNITE program has been really supportive. Um, trying to get equal pay passed in the state of Louisiana is an arduous task. Um, and black women are here to say that we support equal pay for everyone and that no one should have to make dangerous decisions or harmful decisions about themselves or their family because they don't have the money to pay for food or, or housing. Um, voter engagement is a really big piece and we're actually going to be doing a legislative training on how to engage elected officials and how um, to make your, vo your vote um, really count um, and what it means to be a part of the electoral process. So we're here supporting that piece as well. Helena Moreno has two bills up today um, that she's advocating with that we, we support. Um, they are allowing um, same-sex couples to be a part of domestic violence. Now, I will say that there, some domestic violence legislation has an injurious effect on communities of color because the criminalization pieces are always harmful and have a detrimental impact on community of color. Um, but we do support the idea of including same-sex couples in that legislation. And that's, so that's what Helena Moreno is doing today as well. Welcome to Our Voice, Our Time, Louisiana Black Women's Legislative Advocacy Day. Today we have the privilege of bringing black women from across the state of Louisiana to Baton Rouge for an advocacy, advocacy day focused on black women's issues. This event, sponsored by State Senator Karen Carter-Peterson, centers the lives and experiences of black women in Louisiana, highlighting the health needs, issues, policy concerns for their families and communities. This first Black Women's Advocacy Day is hosted by Women with a Vision. Women with a Vision is a New Orleans-based nonprofit funded, founded, I'm sorry, in 1989, 28 years ago, by a grassroots collective of African American women in response to the spread of HIV, AIDS, and communities of color. And I do want to say that we have one of our founding members, Danita Muse, in the building today. So if you see Danita, let's thank Danita for starting this organization. Today, Women with a Vision works to improve the lives of marginalized women, their families, and communities by addressing the social conditions that hinder the health and well-being. We accomplish this through relentless advocacy, health education, supportive services, and community-based research-sponsored partnerships. Black women across the state of Louisiana have always been the cornerstone of the fight for equality and justice in our communities and for our children. We have advocated from every position available, and we have fought hard. However, it has been a struggle to find a place where intersectional, I'm sorry, in the intersection of our communal and familiar responsibilities and commitments can coexist with the interpersonal issues we face as being black women. There are a few issues that we have centered today, and I'm going to read those issues now. All women are deserving of access to quality health care. To provide it is not only a commitment to the individual, but to families across Louisiana. 
All women have the right to economic freedom and equity so that, they, so that they are not forced into making unhealthy decisions about their personal well-being or the well-being of their families in order to survive. The criminal justice system should not treat any member of the community differently than the other. To do so based on race or gender identity has a disparaging impact on already marginalized communities, their family members, and the families across Louisiana as a whole. Universal access to quality education is a community commitment to sustainable households, and strong voter engagement allows all members of this city and state to be represented and heard in an effort to ensure that all our constitutional guarantees are safeguarded. As a director of policy and advocacy at Women with a Vision, the strength that encompasses the people that I have the privilege of interacting and working with can at times be overwhelming. There are so many in our immediate and global communities that face each day with not just a mountain, but a cordillera. And yet they survive. They survive in brilliance and beauty. They survive with empty pots and pockets, but with full hearts overflowing with loves and dreams and hope. They survive in ways that bring me to my knees with humility. I fight with them not because they are helpless. I fight with them because I want to be a tour guide to the observer by telling the story that is untold. Giving glory to the fortitude engulfed in the excellence that each person has inside themselves. I fight with them because I am able to stand on their truth. I fight with them because I know one day when the blind masses finally put on their reading glasses, they will see them for who they are and we will win. Thank you. So we have an exciting day planned today. We're starting a little bit late, so we're going to be moving like rapid fire, all right? At this time, we're supposed to be in committee meetings. So for those of you that already have your packets, that kind of got the briefing on the bus, um, I'm going to let you, um, the house is on this side. Am I correct? If I'm facing this way, house is on this side, um, senators on that side. Um, so I'm going to have you all move to the committee meetings. But before I do, something amazing happened um, while we were preparing for this advocacy day. Um, a couple of our cities um, and some of our um, council members in some of our cities decided that they wanted to center black women's health as a issue that the community would rally against and support. Um, New Orleans was one. <laughs> We also have a councilwoman from Grambling who has, um, is going to read the proclamation and the um, resolution that she has brought. Councilwoman Green, um, if you could um, come forward. I want you all to listen to these words because this is a city's commitment to you and your health. And these resolutions are sent to every legislated official in this building. Right, so they understand that she has. I, I, I'm saying you because you 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 are because you're the sole um, uh, person on this resolution from Grambling. Am I correct? For Baton Rouge. For Baton Rouge. I'm sorry for Baton Rouge. I'm sorry for Baton Rouge. Um, there's also one from Grambling, and there's one in um, New Orleans. The one in New Orleans was passed unanimously by the entire city council. Um, and so I, I want to also say that all of these resolutions were written, sponsored, and supported by Black elected councilwomen in their city. All right. So I would like to y'all to give a huge round of applause to Councilwoman Green. Thank you and good morning. Uh, my name is Erica Green. I'm the council person for District 5 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I want to welcome you, my sister friends and new faces to Baton Rouge, to the state capitol. Welcome you on behalf of our mayor president, Sharon Westenbroom, who, if you didn't notice, is just like me. We're double minorities. We're African American and we're women. And we're an elected office. And that's something that you don't see much. But luckily, in the past year, people have been getting it that we need a face um, to our issues and we need somebody that understands what we stand for and so I thank you for inviting me 
and thank you Women with a Vision Incorporated. And not to um, prolong uh, more things or repeat what was said earlier, just want to focus on the goal. The goal is that our legislative body will prioritize black women's access to health care, open pathways to economic equity, commit to criminal justice reform and support our ability to peacefully and successfully care for our families and our children. That's one of the things that we listed in the proclamation from Baton Rouge. Now I stand before you, I started by saying that we have our first elected black um, mayor um, in Baton Rouge, but I watched a video the other day, um, and well, Je Jeff Johnson said, it's not just about being the first person in the seat, it's about providing the infrastructure what you're doing today is providing the infrastructure that supports everything that we stand for. So a thank you again for coming, and please note that today I proclaim Wednesday, April 26, 2017, as Louisiana Black Women's Advocacy Day. Thank you. So I'm Ashley Shelton and I'm the executive director of the Power Coalition and we are a 501c3 table which basically means that we have the state voter file and we use the voter file to engage and talk to citizens across the state and really think about how do we mobilize and engage um, communities across the state and building a pathway to power around the things that we care about. And what I often, um, you know, when we're organizing and talking to black women across the state, what we often uh, tell them is, you know, think about every regressive policy that is enacted in this state. Think about every policy that does not work in your life um, that you have encountered, whether it's your kid being suspended from school or expelled for something as simple as a fight, or maybe your kid has been incarcerated in the juvenile justice uh, system because of a fight or something as simple as, um, you, know, you know, as playing a, a prank or a joke with his friends that gets misinterpreted by the teacher or the administration at a school, all the way to um, laws that we have seen be much more uh, punitive um, you know, to, to women of color. And so when I, we talk about these processes and why they matter, um, I think that black women in the state of Louisiana are uniquely stated to really change this state and to change outcomes for our families. And I wanna talk a little bit about what's in here, and then I'll go through a couple of the slides and then tell you a couple of stories about how black women are already changing the state of Louisiana, kicking butt, taking names, and how we have the opportunity to continue to do that. And so the first thing that you have in your booklet is just, it's just a toolkit. It's on all the things that you need to know about talking to your legislator, um, you know, setting an agenda when you meet with them, be clear, don't, uh, don't overstate your message or the facts. You know, like these things that I think, um, I was sharing with Nia, when we talk to elected officials, we oftentimes feel like they're way up here. They've been elected to office, um, you know, they're, they're uh, well polished, they've got their suits on, but the reality is, is that they are folks that have won a popularity contest in your community. Um, it does not mean that they understand your issues, it doesn't mean that they understand any issues. And so our role as citizens and as citizen advocates is to ensure that they understand where we're coming from. And we take for granted that somehow because they want an elected office that they truly understand how policies affect real people on the ground in community. And th those things are not true. They do not understand. They do not know. They do not have the analysis that you have about what's happening in your community. And so these, this, these legislative days are so important because legislators, the, let me tell you the top three things they say to me when we are advocating for different things. Well, Ashley, you know, that sounds great. But um, none of my constituents are calling me and telling me that this is an issue. I haven't heard from one person that said that this is a problem. I was like, not one. I said, oh, I'll get back to you. Give me one second. <laughs> and so then we do that work of activating our folks in that particular community and saying, our folks do care about these issues. Our folks, and maybe they haven't contacted you because they don't think you care. And so how do we make continuously contact our legislators, and whether it's at, state, at the state level or the community, uh, local level, and or even sometimes too at the federal level, we've got to be vocal, we've got to be seen, and we certainly should be heard. And so in this first little piece, you'll just kind of see all kinds of, you know, all kinds of information, all of the standing committees of the legislature, um, a snapshot of how a bill becomes a law, uh, 
there's even some sample committee analysis of how bills, are, you know, how bills are broken down in the Senate and, and House. And so I just wanted to just put, um, you know, encourage you guys to kind of look through it um, and um, and just know that that is available to you. It also talks about for those of you who are, um, you know, I always encourage folks to go and sit down with legislators and represent yourself and then represent an organization because there are rules that are different for 501c3 nonprofits um, and, and an individual, right? So as an individual, I can lobby as much as I would like. Um, but if, as I represent the Power Coalition, which is a 501c3 nonpartisan organization, there's only so much that I can do um, on the lobbying front. I can lobby. Uh, most nonprofits can lobby up to 30% of their budget if they do have funds that allow them to do that. But for the majority of nonprofit organizations, they like to stay on the advocacy side. And so, um, and so I always encourage folks to first put their hat on as a citizen because you can talk about the things that are important to you as much as you like and as often as you like. And then put on your hat as representing an organization and saying, I, you know, I'm here with women with a vision and I want to talk to you about the things that are important to black women, um, you know, in, in the community. And also, too, there's a misnomer that anytime you talk to a legislator or or an elected official that you are lobbying. That is not correct. If you, lobbying does not start until you name a specific piece of legislation, you call a specific bill number, and you advocate for or against that bill. Everything up until that point is education, information, and the opportunity to connect with an elected official. And so I can talk about um, the issues facing black people in the state of Louisiana all you know for for days and days and days that is not lobbying that is cert, cert, simply just advocating I can also provide data, stats, and facts on any number of different issues. Also, just advocacy. That is not lobbying. That is just stating the facts of what, are, what folks are experiencing around the issue that we're talking about. And so do know that there is a very long way to go before you actually get to lobbying and a lot of educating that needs to happen because again I want to remind you these are folks that want a contest these are not folks that really truly always have an in-depth analysis about your issue and oftentimes when you take the time to educate and talk to them you can have an impact um, and you can make a difference and so I want to pull you guys to the to that to the pot to the presentation it's pathways to win and then the first slide is um, is the power coalition logo and I'm not going to go through everything Every slide, but there are a couple of points of power that I want to make um, and a few stories that I want to tell you. So the first slide is the state of Louisiana. Um, and what I want to say is that, you know, we, sometimes we think that the numbers and the odds are so far against us, it's so hard to make change. But, you know, really, um, you know, it's interesting. One, let's, let's talk about where people live in this state. So, um, even before you saw this map, probably most of you knew that fit, more than 50% of the state's population and tax base come from South Louisiana. So, Baton Rouge South is where the majority of the people of this state live, and it is where the majority of the tax base for this state comes from. And so what you see in this map is that the state basically breaks down in thirds. So you've got about 1.7 folks that live in the five most populated parishes. So East Baton Rouge, New Orleans, Jefferson, um, St. Tammany, you've got a, um, and then Caddo, you've got a ton of folks that are living in those kind of the big metros in the state. Then you've got a second tier of folks that kind of live in those other kind of large cities, Lafayette, uh, Homa, uh, Lake Charles, Rapides, Monroe, you kind of see that there's that kind of second tier of those big cities that, that folks live. But then you've got another third of the state that's spread all over that are in the, the least populated, I mean, 50 least populated parishes across the state. And so when we talk about rural, even though our experiences may be in those urban centers or in those metros, you've got a third of the state that's living in rural communities uh, like New Iberia and other places. And New Iberia probably is also not even really qualified uh, as rural because it's got more people than some of these other the parishes, and so just to give you a sense of where people are in the state. The next slide is about uh, the voting age population. So you've got about 2.2 million uh, folks that are that are, um, that are that are white that are voters and registered voters in the state of Louisiana. Another 1.1 million that are African American, and then um, an emerging um, Latino electorate that um, that's here. And so that just kind of gives you a sense of where folks are. 
Um, but one of the things that we want to talk about and that we've been talking to black women about across the, the state is that if you turn to the slide of the House of Representatives and the Senate, you know, in, this, in the House, in order to um, move a bill favorably, you've got to have, you've, you've got to get a 54 votes for a majority. So there are 105 seats on the House side. You've got to get 54 votes for a majority. Um, you've got 41 Democrats, 58 Republicans, three independents. And what I often tell folks is that when you look at these, at these numbers, you've got to also, too, on the Senate side, you've, there are 39 seats, you've got to get 20 votes for, uh, for a win. Now, Here's something that's really scary. Now turn the page. So we think that these processes are um, processes that we don't, we just don't have time to get involved in. It's just too complicated. It's uh, you know like this isn't for regular community people. Well, the House of Representatives, 50% of the seats on the House side went unopposed. So when you think about power, I mean, if you don't even have an, you don't even have opposition. Nobody is even willing to run against you. What does that signal to the person in that elected seat? You love me. I'm doing a great job. <laughs> whether that's true or not. And so when you think about building power, and certainly as we think about building power, you know, it is very clear to us that 50% of the seats on the House side go unopposed. And I don't know how, I don't know about you, but it doesn't feel like there's a whole lot of justice um, in there, but there is a ton of opportunity for justice and equity to, to be built. And so, um, and then too, even for the ones that did have an uh, opponent, most of those, um, only 15 went to a runoff. And so, you know, just thinking about how much of our, this stuff gets decided before um, we even get to vote, because at this point, you're not even voting for half the people that are even eligible to um, be opposed in an election. And so, um, and so just wanted to share that. And then one of the other pieces, too, you'll see on the, on the other side, you know, one of the things that we know, too, is that everybody thinks that elections come down to these huge numbers, you know, 500, 600 uh, votes that can make a difference. And what you'll see if you look at the bottom bullet point on the on the other page, you know uh, Representative Z Zarenge, who's out of uh, Homa, you know he won by six votes six votes. And so I tell folks all the time, I mean, that's literally like you get your unit out of your house at, to go vote. <laughs> so my, my family of five can change an election. And so I always remind folks that it's not this these big numbers. It's not um, this big, scary thing that you can't break down and have an influence, but that some of the people that represent us are being elected by such small numbers as, as six votes. And then let me tell you another story. I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to meet and or work with Marcus Hunter out of North Louisiana. Yep, so Marcus Hunter, he's an advocate. He fights for the issues that we care about. Marcus Hunter won by three votes. This, Not this last election cycle, but the one before. Three votes. He, literally his mama and his sister and his daddy. I mean, three <laughs> votes. And so I remind folks that sometimes these elections are not about, um, like, we don't have the ability to influence or change it. We absolutely have the power and the ability to change things happening in our community, but also too, there's a downside to this, which is that, so we have an advocate, um, you know, for progressive issues like Marcus Hunter, whose whole political career could have been ended by three votes. If three people would have stayed home, we could have ended up with a legislator that didn't care. We could have ended up with a legislator that was not going to advocate for our issues. And so I always, you know, I always remind folks that, you know, like we, our votes count, our votes matter, our voices matter. Getting out to vote is not like if it's raining, you know, we love to stay home. No, we got to get out because this, some of this stuff is coming down to um, just a handful of votes. And then when we go see in runoff elections, the turnout's even lower. And so in those runoff elections, we some of those elections are coming down to two and 300 folks. So how many folks have at least 200 Facebook friends, 200 Twitter followers, 200 friends on Snapchat or whatever it is? I mean, so we all have the ability to use our, our individual platforms um, and our friends and our networks to encourage people to vote because these elections are, you know, coming down down to really slim victories. Same thing on the Senate side. Half of the seats unopposed. So the Senate, 20 unopposed races. So half of the seats of the body of 39 did not have any opposition. 
And so what that says to me is that we have to, one, build a pipeline, more every day, Folks got to get out and, and, and think about what does it mean to run. Um, I think we heard uh, Councilwoman Erica Green talk about it earlier this morning. This is infrastructure. This is what it takes um, to feel for, for a regular person to even attempt to think about running for office, to even feel like they have enough support um, to be able to even take on that endeavor. Because sometimes it's not just about money. It really is about support and infrastructure. And so all of the women in this room represent a real opportunity for for us to think about what does it look like, um, you know, to get Miss Raven um, thinking about city council in a few years. What does it What does it take to, you know, to think about um, somebody in this very room taking on the machine, and especially when you know what the votes come down to. And so, um, and so, I just wanted to kind of throw some of those numbers out there because three people and six people decide um, an election is a really powerful point for what we have the opportunity to do. And then I want to um, kind of skip forward. I mean, one of the things that we, you know, we just showed was kind of the change in vote share between the governor and the presidential race. You know, it's really interesting how things move in our state, and I won't talk a ton about that, but one of the things that we showed, or that we know from the data from the governor's race to the presidential race, is that our state moves a lot. There's a lot of fluid, um, there's a lot of fluidity around voters and, and their values. And so, you know, and so folks like to think that we're just a red state. We are red state, but we also have a very purple <laughs> heart <laughs> and leanings. And so the state and, um, and the voter um, the, and the vote share, it moves and it's fluid. And I think what that means and what it certainly says to us is that we have the opportunity to change some things. Um, there's a slide um, at the almost towards the end where there's the blue state of Louisiana um, that talks about African-American women. So they're about 900 20,000 Af registered African-American voters in the state of Louisiana. We just left a committee room where we were trying to re-enfranchise uh, more African-American uh, men who we know are disproportionately affected by the criminal justice system. And because of uh, them being on probation or parole are not given the right to vote. They pay taxes, they go to work, they raise a family. Um, and so a lot of the work that we do is absolutely that, making sure that folks are, in, are franchised, they have the right to vote, and then once they can vote, making sure that they can execute that in any way that they want to. But what this says, though, is that we, you know, 57% are African-American women, you know, 48% reside in those those major metros that we talked about. So we actually have a, a real uh, depth of uh, leadership and opportunity in the major cities across the, um, you know, across the state of Louisiana. But one of the things that you'll see is that we have 38% of African-American folks that rarely vote. And so um, one of the things that we've been able to do as the Power Coalition is try to focus on where are folks, where are the majority minority communities and how do we get them to stand up and recognize the power that they have. And so one of the things that was super exciting um, a lot in 2015 was that we knew Algiers was a majority minority district. It had a majority, uh, it had like 19,000 African-American women who were infrequent voters, so they voted for the president but didn't vote otherwise. So what that meant was, was that they certainly could have an influence at the, at the, at the you know, the presidential race and they show up and they've got their nice little blue spot in Algiers, but when it came down to state elections, their voices were rare, rarely counted and rarely heard. Um, and so we started talking to black women in Algiers, knocking doors, making phone calls, and saying, you can really decide the leadership in the future of your community. Like, why? I, you know, we got to get out and vote, and we have to decide, do we want what we've always had, or do we want someone that's going to be accountable to us? And so, through those efforts, for the first time in 25 years, Algiers has a black house of representatives, uh, rep um, and uh, what's his name? Oh my God, I'm, they're both Carter, Gary Carter, and then Senator Troy Carter were elected in 2015 to represent this majority minority district that had been represented by people of uh, people not of color for 25 years. And so we know that our folks can stand up. We know that they can have an impact. We know that they can make a difference. Uh, we know that in this particular instance, this was black women making a difference in their very own community and the leadership that they thought was going to be the most representative of their, um, of their interest and responsive to their needs. And so we know that it works, that if we understand and have some information and facts and then we do that work in community, that we can mobilize folks to vote. There's another 20,000 African-American women in home 
Oklahoma and thinking about how do we mobilize and activate them to make sure that whoever is representing them is doing that in a way that is certainly responsive and reflective of the issues facing African American women and African American families. And so I just wanted to share, you know, kind of some of those pieces. You know, at the legislature this year, we've got some interesting things happening, and so I'm going to take a few minutes. So, you know, we've got a busy day today. There's all kinds of stuff going on. Some of you got an opportunity to sit in different committees, and I just want to offer. A couple of thoughts. One is, you know, like I said, these are everyday folks. You know, you can put in a card, call a legislator out of any committee. They will happily come out and talk to you. Um, you know, it was interesting. We were riding on the elevator with Representative Ivy. I forget his first name. And it was really interesting because, you know, one of the things that they do and what I, what I felt like he was trying to do was to have us, a whole elevator full of black women, support his slant on an issue of justice, right? And so absolutely, um, we want to create accountability um, um, for folks that have been found guilty of crimes. We want to, you know, and so he talked about the criminal justice reform package. And so, but, you know, but he, he wanted to me, I just felt like he was trying to slant us a certain way. And so, you know, we got off the elevator. I know several folks talked to him and gave him cards so that we could kind of continue a real conversation because you can't really talk about issues on the elevator. I mean, you can, but, but we're not really talking about, as a black woman, um, you know, in Baton Rouge, how that criminal justice package of bills has really affected my life or the life of people in my community or my family. Um, and so, you know, and so I was glad that folks did took that time to kind of share and give those cards. But I also pulled him to the side to say, I said, you know, we want to be clear as black women that we care about criminal justice reform. Um, and I understand that you want to divide us around one specific issue around this bill. I said, but at the end of the day, we do stand with the idea and the belief that black men are disproportionately affected by criminal justice issues, that they have not been fairly treated, fairly given the opportunity um, to push. We know that also, too. That's it's not just just African American men, it's now also African American women that they are um, finding in our criminal justice system. And we see that even more so at the juvenile justice level. And so, you know, I, I just took some time to kind of uh, be very clear with him about, you know, like it's great to have uh, elevator conversations, but what you won't be doing is testifying and saying, I had a great conversation with women with a vision and they support my ideas. And which is not the same thing as women with a vision saying, we, cause we support criminal justice reform, but we do have some issues when it comes to those that have been convicted of sexual abuse or sexual, uh, you know, abuse-related crimes or other things. And so, you know, it's always like, like the little tricks of how they engage us um, and how we are being friendly and thoughtful, and they're not <laughs> sometimes. And so, and I think that, you know, um, I, he, he was very thoughtful in his reflection back and, um, and even went into the committee room uh, where they were discussing the... Um, the voter reenfranchisement of formerly incarcerated folks, and he offered up a friendly amendment that I think, um, you know, that I think set the tone for hopefully that that bill getting out of committee positively. And so, you know, so he was thoughtful, and he, you know, and he certainly heard, you know, um, you know, kind of heard my reflection back to him that you, you know, like that you don't get to speak on our behalf because we had a conversation at elevator, but that you know we are here in the room and we can speak for ourselves. <laughs> so, um, and so, but I say that so. I I say that to say as well that, um, you know, pull folks out of committee, talk to them, um, make those phone calls, make those um, those emails. You know, there's so many, okay, there's so many resources um, in this room in terms of organizations and support. You want to write op-eds, you want to uh, send emails to your legislators, you want to do whatever. All of us have, um, you know, the Power Coalition, Women with a Vision. I mean, I, there's just so many great groups in this room, um, you know, that can provide you with support around. If you want to say something and you feel like you you don't have the facts you need, you don't have the data you need. We have some of that stuff. You know, we've got tons of information about where black women are in the state, how different um, issues affect black women. Um, whatever that is, if you're interested in doing something and or acting, there are some great folks in this room that can help support you in doing that, but that we've got to be vocal, we've got to be visible, and we've got to stay in contact and hold them accountable because, again, the line that we hear is, Michelle, nobody's calling me for my district 
saying that that's a problem and the reality is we know that it's a problem and and I always push back and say well is it is it that or is it that your people feel like you don't care enough <laughs> for them to call you and say and also too um, when you're in committees you know put your cards in if you're in support of something put your green cards in if you're opposed to something, put your red cards in. If you have information to present, put your white cards in. And so I always encourage folks, don't be afraid. I mean, these are these are regular everyday people that have been elected to office um, and they don't know. We assume that they know, but they really don't know. And so talk, engage, um, you know, educate, take the time to, you know, to, to help them understand your point of view and to also let them know that you're gonna continue to talk to them, you're gonna continue to reach out, you're gonna continue to hold them accountable both before while they're running for office and when they're in office um, and 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 onward and upward because we also know too even with this current legislative session we've got several the almost the entire New Orleans de delegation is running for local office in the city of New Orleans and so we certainly should be thinking about how are we looking at how they're voting on issues right here at the state capitol and how they're representing us here and then also too how that then translate to how they're going to represent us on a local level and I remind folks you know um, um, you know, the closer you get to your house, it, that elected leader, that elected leader, is having more influence on your life than anybody else. You get to the state level, which you know we've had a, a lot of alignment before this most recent administration at the federal and the, and the local level around doing more progressive things. But the state has always kind of been an issue. But now we've got some alignment at the state and the local level, and we want to hold ground around the things that we care about, so that we don't go backwards or lose the power that we've had. And I think that as we do that, we've got to give them the cover, the political cover to do that, and we've got to stand our ground on our issues because right now, you know, there's a lot of fighting going on and a lot of pushing. There's tax reform. Nobody wants to talk about tax reform. It is not sexy. It is boring. But the reality is, is that the co the conversation is either we're going to tax real, pe real, real, we're going to tax business or we're going to tax people. And what this state has struggled with is that we disproportionately tax poor people um, versus business. And so we've got to we've got to have some conversations about how do we really change the conversation. In the state, and how do we do it in a way that really benefits real people? And so, um, like I said, we've got tons of resources, we've got tons of data, tons of information. You know, if you if you want to speak out on any particular issue, I know um, we've got talking points. We got whatever you want. <laughs> we got we are we can find it if we don't have it. And so, we just encourage you guys get involved, stay involved. I'm so excited to see this room full of beautiful, beautiful uh, black women fighting for the things that they believe in. Um, so excited to be um, a great partner with the women with the vision and have so enjoyed working with them and um, and doing this work. And one other resource, so PAR, the PAR Guide. So P Public Affairs Research Council does this guide every year, and it's all the legislators, it's all the committees, it's all the the maps it's even got some of the different um uh, state level boards and so they give them they they do provide them free if you request it um but they also have an app and so you can just download the app on your phone you just uh, go to your app uh the app store and uh, request par guide p-a-r guide and then you can download this whole thing right on your phone and so you can find folks you can call folks you can email folks it's got all their information every way you can find them <laughs> so i suggest that you do that and you do that often um, and it's a great uh, resource. And if folks, um, and I know Nia put this in your book as well. All of the, um, all of the legislators are in here. All of the different committees, you know. But we have some real opportunities to change some things. And I think that you know we've looked into ballot initiatives. We've looked into um, all of the elections that are coming up, both locally and statewide. And I think that we have a real opportunity for your voices to be heard and for y'all to change the world. And so I always tease folks. We tried to stay, you know, we tried to save the country, but they nobody was listening to us. But that's okay. We can have a much more direct impact right here in the state and certainly in our local communities. And so thank you guys. What would you say to people that say, oh, you know, my vote doesn't count. Uh, it doesn't matter. It absolutely does count and it does matter. Um, so on the back of our shirts, can I, can I show you the back of the shirts? On the back of the shirts. It talks about we have almost one million um, African American registered voters. More than half of them are black women. And when you look at the, where clusters of black women live throughout the state, um, we actually have the ability to change the outcome of elections. For example, in Algiers, Algiers had not had a black elected official for 25 years. Um, when it was looked at that the numbers of black women could actually influence that vote and kind of change the outcome of that. It did, and um, Representative Kerry Carter um, comes from that area. And so, you know, our vote 
absolutely does matter. Um, we, we have a, um, may I grab one? <laughs> have these amazing training guides that we've put together inside the guide. Um, we have these election calendars and the calendars outline when and where people are supposed to vote. It says exactly what um, races are up, when early voting is, um, when you have to register to vote, when the election day is. Um, we have that all the way through 2020. Um, we also have a piece that outlines um, every race in Orleans, Jefferson, and St. Bernard Parish from now through 2020 um, so that people can be informed of when they need to have their voices heard. Um, I always say you cannot change policy until you change the policy maker. And when you have elected officials that don't see you as a full human being, don't really listen to the things you have to say, you know, sometimes the position you have to take is, okay, I'm coming to get your job, and you know, and I'm going to vote in someone who does see me as a full human being so I can advocate for the rights that I know that I have the right to have. Is there anything else you want to add? I, I just want to say thank you to Karen Carter-Peterson. Um, Senator has been gracious um, giving us her time um, and resources for us to be able to put this day together. We have over 30 organizations around the country that have supported this day. We have black women from across the state that are here. There are a lot of women who wanted to be here that couldn't be here because of the intersectionality of our, their lives. So I, you know, I want to give a shout out to them. I also would like to um, pay homage our executive director at Women with a Vision, Dion Haywood. Um, she is home recovering from breast cancer. She is now cancer free. Um, we are grateful to have her as a part of our lives and um, we, know, we know she's here in spirit. So I just want to you know, mention that as well. And where can people get more information? Um, so if you have in, you want information on Women with a Vision, um, we are located at 1226 North Broad Street in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, and our website, I always get it wrong, so it's www.wwav-no.org.